God bless everyone. Welcome back to Walking Through the Word, where we walk verse by verse through the Word of God. Beloved, I want to thank the Lord for his goodness, and we want to thank the Lord that he is our pillar. He is our refuge in a weary land. He is our rock and shelter of defense. In times of trial and trouble, one assurance we have is that we know God will always take care of his own. He will protect his children in disasters and destructions, in calamities. Hallelujah. We know that he is our shelter as in Psalm 91, and he will cover us with his feathers that no evil shall come nigh our dwelling. No plague shall come nigh our habitation. Why? Because the Lord will give his angels charge over us to keep us in all of our way. Is this assurance that we have as believers when we put our trust in the Lord that he is our defense? And oh, what a wonderful comfort that is in times like this with everything that's spiring out of control in the world today with the war between Israel and Iraq, situation that's fueling with the Ukraine and NATO, the U.S., and the situation in the South China Sea, the war with North Korea, even the war going on in Africa. We know, hallelujah, that we are aspiring to the book of Revelations right to the end. These are the end times where the coming of the Lord is very, very soon. And for that, we can look up because we know our redemption draws nigh. Hallelujah. We see Bible prophecy unfolding before our very eyes. And it's exciting when we know and love the Lord because we know we're about to see Jesus very soon. Matthew chapter 24 is the subject today as we conclude our verse-to-verse -verse study, starting at verse 42, speaking of the qualifications of a faithful servant and the importance of being watchful. Well, I'm so excited about this study and we're really going to go into it because it pertains to each and every believer. That's right. It pertains to you and me. And we need to take heed so that we can be ready. We're going to talk all about it when we come back. Welcome back to Walking Through the Word. I want to first thank all of our new subscribers for subscribing to FGM TV. Welcome to our online family. We're so happy and blessed that you are with us. And we pray that you will send these videos out to others who you believe need to hear this message. Before we start this study today, please like this video and make sure you're still subscribed or subscribe if you have not and press the bell icon that you can be alerted each and every week as I upload new videos. Okay, here we go. Starting on Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. The Bible says, and this is Jesus speaking, watch therefore, for you do not know the hour which your Lord does come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in which watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Okay, so in this first section, the Lord is speaking of being watchful. And he says, We've already spoken about this previously in the verses before, but it's going to go into some very good, important details that I want to focus on this week. He says, you don't know the day and hour that the Lord comes. We heard the Lord speak this three times in the same chapter. Okay, this is the third time 
he is speaking it. And uh, when the Lord speaks something once, it's important. But when he speaks something twice, that means it's confirmed. You really need to listen. But when he speaks it three times, that means pay attention because I'm really, really saying something that's extremely important. The good man of the house, the one who's been entrusted with the wealth, the one who has been deemed as a steward, the stewards of the earth, the merchants of the earth, the treasurers of the earth, those who have been empowered to have a kingly finance, to steward out wealth, okay, who've been given enterprises or who have dominion over different sectors of the earth. It says, if they had known in which watch the thief would come, what their four watches, the first watch, second watch, third watch, or fourth watch of the night, the thief would come. Who's the thief? The thief is Jesus. He's in this particular um, parable. The thief, the symbol of the thief is Jesus, although we know he's not a thief, but he comes as a thief. He comes in a descriptive way like a thief. He comes because he's coming to take his jewels. He said, if they had known what hour the thief would come, they would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken unto. So in other words, it's going to be such a disaster, such destruction when the Lord comes, which is the day of the harpazo, the day of the catching away, the day of the great escape, the day uh, of the rapture. It's going to be a day of great destru destruction as we spoke last week. One shall be taken, the other left. The same day we talked about that as the saints go up, destruction, disaster goes down. The nuclear bombs hit the earth the same day of the catching away. And so the house is broken up. It's destroyed. The Lord, the Lord is revealing here that those who are left behind see disaster, destruction. There's sadness. There's grief. There's remorse. That's what is going to happen especially to believers who get left behind, such depression, such oppression, such regret that they missed the coming of the Lord. There's going to be great remorse and no relief, no comfort for those who are left behind. So he says you need to watch because the house is going to be destroyed. The, the earth is going to begin to be terribly destroyed that everything's going to be broken down. The things that people put their trust in, their idols, are going to be laid to waste. People who spent millions of dollars on their homes, their homes are going to be in one second blown up. Cities that they loved and treasured where they went shopping, there's, there's going to be great destruction to the merchandise industry, especially New York. New York is going to be burned with fire in one day. So. We need to examine where we're putting our treasure. The Lord says, do not put your treasure on the earth where moth and rust destroys, but put your treasure in heaven. Hallelujah. Where there is no depreciation, with no, where there is no corruption, where there's no destruction, where moths and thieves do not break forth in steel. Because where our treasure is, that's where our heart is going to be also. So he's speaking of a heart issue here that... We need to watch, and the watchfulness is not only speaking of attentiveness of looking with your physical eyes. He's not only speaking of looking at the news and listening to the newspapers or listening to what the Word of God tells you is happening by the Spirit, because God will give us divine revelation beyond what the newspapers are saying. We'll get the news first because we're in tune with the Spirit of Truth, and then we'll hear it on the news later to confirm what God has said. That's really the way it should go. But he's saying, he's not only speaking about an attentiveness, a visual attentiveness, but he's speaking of a heart attentiveness, that our hearts need to be hearing hearts. Our ears need to be ears that are in tune and open to hear what the Lord says. And he's speaking of a watchfulness of the heart, that our heart needs to be focused on Jesus and Jesus alone. Hallelujah. I love that. When we keep our eyes on Jesus, just on Jesus, then you won't miss the rapture. You know, I'm reminded of the story of Elijah and Elijah. As Elijah was getting ready to finish his earth's mission, 
there was a sensing by Elijah. In the school of the prophets, they knew that Elijah would be leaving soon. So they, they were perceiving that the, the, he was going to leave, you know, just like we perceive Jesus is going to come. Uh, prophets perceived that Elijah was going to leave. And they said to Elijah, do you know that, you know, your master is going to be taken from you this day? They were, they were sensing it. They didn't know the exact day, but they knew around the time. And they kept all hinting to Elijah, you know, you're with him all the time, but he's getting ready to leave. Elijah and Elijah passed mantles and the mantle only fell to Elijah when he was watching. When Elijah said, there's one thing I want before you go, give me a double portion of your spirit. What did Elijah reply? He replied, you will receive a double portion of my spirit if when I am going, you see me go. Wow. What a revelation. He's speaking of eyes that are centered on their master, on the man of God, focused on heaven, the things of God, eyes in this situation, in these end times that are focused only on Jesus. Beloved, if we keep our eyes like on our Elijah, the, the true Elijah, Jesus Christ, the true prophet, if we keep our eyes on him all the time, hallelujah, when he comes, we're going to be with him. When we come, we're going to go up with him the chariot of fire. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I like that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. When the chariot of fire goes up, we're going up with him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, when it comes to the end times, the mantle will not fall upon those who leave, but the mantle of a double or triple portion is going to be falling on those who are left behind because they're going to need it in the end times just to survive. As great darkness penetrates the earth, and Satan's minions have dominion and fill the earth in a manner and in an intensity that the world has never seen that kind of darkness or oppression before. God's people who are not ready, even though they're God's people, if they get left behind because they weren't prepared, they weren't ready, they will need double, triple portion of the Spirit of the Lord to endure the times of evil. Well, I went off the subject matter there, but that's just what the Holy Spirit was revealing to me. Continuing in verse 44, therefore be ready for in such an hour you think not the son of man comes. Now he's speaking the same, the same thing he said earlier. He's coming in an hour that they think not. But listen, he's only coming in an hour to those who don't know when he's coming because they're not watching. So this is kind of like a double, a double play. In one sense, the Lord is saying, if you're not watching, I'm going to come when you don't expect me. But then he says, generally, no, none of us know when he's coming. Is that a contradiction? No, it's not a contradiction. He's saying, you may not know the exact time I'm coming, but those who love me, those who are walking close to me, those who are anticipating my coming. Um, I have a love for Jesus. They're all and a hatred for this world. They're always wanting to get out of here, <laughs> even though they have work to do and the harvest is ripe and they may even be joyful in the harvest. They still, there's no place like home. There's no place of being with our, like being with our bridegroom, sitting at the feet of Jesus and loving him and being in his kingdom. This is our great inheritance. This is our inheritance. He is our inheritance and he's who we're waiting for. And so we are sensitive to when he's coming. We will not be caught off guard. So he will not be coming to us in an hour that we think not because we'll know the hour. Isn't that interesting? In one sense, we won't know the day and hour he comes specifically on the exact calendar date, but we'll know the hour, hallelujah, the season, the almost exact timing. Our spirits will let us know something's going to happen today. <laughs> hallelujah. And we'll be called away as we hear the trumpet sound. Cross-referencing this verse, this reminds me of another verse where Jesus spoke something very similar when he was speaking to the church of Sardis. In Revelations chapter 3, verse 1, and to the angel of the church of Sardis, right? These things says he that has the seven spirits of God, the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you live and are dead. 
Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore you shall not watch, I will come on you as a thief and you shall not know what hour I will come upon you. In this context, John, the revelator, is revealing what the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him to the church of Sardis, the same church system that is in the earth today. All of the seven churches that Jesus spoke about in Revelation are types and symbols of churches, of groups of people, the church of God, that are active in the church today. Each and every one of us can be a part of one of those church systems because it's a heart attitude. Uh, There are characteristics of these churches that dwell in each and every person. And so to understand this, we must go back and understand what was happening in Sardis. What were some of the characteristics of the church of Sardis? Well, Sardis was located in Asia Minor. It was a city well known for its softness and luxury. It had a well-observed reputation for apathy and immorality. The combination of easy money and a loose moral environment made the people of Sardis notoriously soft and pleasure-loving. The city was very wealthy in decadence. Despite the reputation of life, Jesus saw them for who they really were. It means that even if you have a good reputation, it's no guarantee of true spiritual character. Despite their good appearance, Jesus saw them as dead. This indicates no struggle, no fight, no persecution. And Jesus didn't encourage the Christians in Sardis to stand strong against persecution or false doctrine, probably because there simply wasn't any significant danger of them. The church of Sardis presented no significant threat to Satan's dominion, so it was worth attacking. You know, that's very interesting. You can have luxury, you can have peace, but it can be a false peace because you're no threat to the enemy. There's no fight. Uh, There are a lot of people who don't have some of the trials that others have. It's not because they're more blessed. It's because that they're that they're on the side of the enemy and there's no reason to attack. They're not a threat to the realm of darkness. The church of Sardis was at peace, but it was a peace of the dead. What Jesus wants the church at Sardis to do is number one, be watchful. Number two, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect for God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent. So then to remember when they were on fire for God, they had to remember the days of their salvation, remember when they made consecrations to the Lord, how they received the engrafted word of truth, believed it and followed it and walked in his commandments. So they were really doers of the word and hearers of the word and hold fast, meaning be strong, cling to Jesus, don't let them go, don't have other gods and repent turn from the way that they're walking in mind in action and in deed and therefore the lord said if you will not watch i will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour i will come upon you this is this verse tied with revelations chapter 3 so when the lord says he's going to come upon us as a thief it's linked to revelations chapter 3 this is very important all of the verses in matthew 24 in luke 21 where he says i'm going to come upon you as a thief if you don't watch he's speaking those who have that same heart attitude, those who are rich and increased with goods, but have need of nothing spiritually, those who have lost their first love, those who are busy working in church, doing all kinds of things, but they have not kept up their spiritual life with Jesus. They're running around. It shows lots of activity. It's a wealthy church. It has lots of programs. It has lots of activities. There's a lot going on, but spiritually the people have died in their relationship with Christ. Isn't that indicative of today's world, the church today, worldwide, even in the charismatic realm, mega churches today, lots of programs, lots of activities, but people lost the joy of their salvation. They seem to forget their first love. The one thing he had against them, that they lost their first love. And therefore, that's why they were not sensitive to know, to discern, to be quickened, to watchfully see and have a hard attitude to know 
when the Lord came. And this is the Lord speaking to Christians. This is all written to Christians. All of the warnings written in Revelations, it's to the churches, the Christian churches, and the characteristics of those churches. And so we all need to be very watchful and careful that we are not Sardis Christians. The Lord concluded this verse by saying, you have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. They will walk with me in white for they are worthy. So we need to keep our garments clean. And what does it talk about? That our garments to stay clean should not be spotted from the world. The Lord said, do not love the world. Do not love the things of the world. Because if we love the world, then the love of the Father is not in us because the Lord is not into the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It's all from the wicked one. And we really cannot know the Lord if we have idolatry in our hearts and have a, another love. And so the church of Sardis had another love. They had a love for materialism, a love for wealth, a love for decadence, a love of pride. Look what I have. Look how great I am because the church of Sardis was a rich city and uh, had very strong strongholds and no one could bring Sardis down. Continuing in verse 45, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord have made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him and in an hour that he is not aware, he will cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there's a blessing to believers who, when the Lord comes, is doing his will. The Lord says, if you're doing the things that he tells us to do in the word, what are some of those things? Feeding the hungry, visiting those in prison, caring for those who are sick, feeding those who need food, right? Doing good like Jesus. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. We will cast out devils if we will do good works. We are continuing in the footsteps of Jesus when he comes. What does he say? He's going to make us ruler over all his goods because he is the king. The world doesn't end at the end of the tribulation period. At the end of those seven years, it goes on for a thousand years after that. And then millions and millions of years after that, because he has a kingdom that will never end. If we think for eternity, the Lord is giving an invitation for you to position yourself to have an eternal promotion. How many of you want an eternal promotion? When we want a promotion on a job, we do everything we can to be to be diligent, to be on time, to be punctual, to be responsible and faithful so that our earthly employer can see us and we believe he's taking good records, right? And that we can eventually get a pay raise or some type of benefits. How much more for the King of glory, the Lord, who is the maker of heaven and earth and who has given us the kingdom of God and who we will spend eternity with. Eternity is a long time. And so the Lord says, this is just the beginning. Your life on this earth is only a practice for heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. And therefore, average this time to be highly positioned in heaven. If you will obey the Lord and do his will on the earth, when he comes, if you're found doing his will, he is going to appoint you in a position of rulership. But if you are not a wise servant, he calls that servant who is lazy, who's not diligent, responsible, who's complacent, an evil servant. If in your heart you have this heart attitude that, oh, Jesus is not coming right away, and you begin to smite your fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken, it says the Lord of that servant is going to come when you don't look for him. Well, basically, he's going to come when he's going to come. But it basically means you will not perceive when he's coming, you know. There's so many people today who says, oh, Jesus is not coming until not 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. That is very similar to this type of attitude. My Lord is delaying his coming. So really, according to the word of God, those who are saying, oh, Jesus is not coming for a long time. 
those are the ones who are on a fine line to fall into this category of being left behind, of being evil servants. This is, this is the verbiage of people who don't care and people who are not looking that they're planning out 20 years and they're not really expecting him to come soon. He's always saying, I'm coming soon. Even though it's still been 2,000 years, those who love him still think he's coming tomorrow. <laughs> I remember in Captain Kuma meeting, she was also saying, oh, these are evil days and the Lord is coming. He's getting ready to come because <laughs> every generation thought Jesus was coming. But that's a type of heart attitude we need to have regardless if he comes or not. We need to be expecting him each and every day. And so with that type of mentality, you get complacent. With that type of mentality of pushing him out five years, oh, it can't happen. For, he's not coming back till seven years. What happens? Births complacency. So what are the effects of complacency? You may begin to drop your guard for holiness, for righteousness, begin to get into arguments, conflicts with your fellow believers, hurt others, not expect expecting retribution from the Lord or judgment to follow, eating and drinking with the drunk and spending too much time with unbelievers without witnessing to them, being overtaken and being changed into their likeness instead of them being changed into the likeness of the Lord. You'll be numb, you'll be dull spiritually to not be able to perceive when he's coming. And the final warning, which is the worst of all, our loving Savior. These verses are speaking to Christians. He shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Beloved, this verse alone cancels out eternal security that once of once saved, always saved. Yes, we have eternal security, but one, it doesn't mean once saved, always saved. We have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Here, the Lord is speaking to Christians who did not prepare, who loved the world more than they loved Jesus who were finding their identity in the world and became spiritually numb to the things of God and no longer had a heart attitude, a love, for, a passion for Jesus to ex want his coming. And they were left behind, but not only left behind, then they suffered eternal damnation because the Lord is clearly saying here that when he comes, that person who was not ready, uh, he will be cast into hell. Okay, if he dies in that situation and dies in that state, he will not go to heaven. His eternal position will be with those where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And beloved, this is very clear because the only place there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, the only place where hypocrites and the wicked are portioned for eternity is Gehenna and the place called Hades, which none of us want to go. It's the realm of darkness. And so the Lord says, choose you this day whom you will serve. And really it's a, it's a question of who are we serving? And if we are serving the Lord, he wants us to serve him with wholehearted passion, wholehearted desire that our service should not overtake our passion for Jesus, that we need to keep our flame on fire for love for Jesus, not to lose that flame even in our service, not to allow our service to be more important than our dedication and love for Christ. So Father, I just want to thank you for my sisters and brothers who've heard this message today. We hear Holy Spirit, which you're speaking to each and every one of us, each and every one of us, Lord, while we're in this body, have a warning from the Spirit of the Lord that we must keep our lamps burning and on fire, not to become complacent, not be, to become wicked servants who push off your coming many years away because we love the things of this world. But Father, we, we do ask that you would come and we pray that you would cleanse our hearts from any characteristics that were identified with the Sardis Christians. If there's anyone watching this broadcast today who says, Janine, I feel like I'm in that situation, we ask Holy Spirit that we just thank you that your love is still here that while there's today, there's always hope. You're always a God of breakthrough. You're always one who
who sticks closer than a brother. You're always one when we call upon you, you're going to answer us. And so I ask for those who've noticed that they have a cold heart or even a dead heart. I just ask Holy Spirit that your fire would rekindle the flames that have gone down. That You are God who can rekindle any fire that's dead. You can reboot it. You can reactivate it. And I ask that you would reactivate the love and passion in uh, my sister and brother's heart today to love you with all of their heart, that they would expect you, that they would love you, that they'd always want to be with you all the time. And that in that preparation, they would be sensitive to be ready. Dear Lord, let us be good stewards, wise stewards, faithful and wise. And so we ask this, Lord, for your grace, for your love, for the Holy Spirit to move upon every heart, to heal them, to refresh them, and to minister your love. Because we know, Lord, that it's the love of God that brings us to repentance. And I ask today that they would feel your love more than ever before because you desire that they would be ready because you prayed a price for them to be at the marriage supper with you for all eternity and to share eternity with you forever. And with those words, I ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today in this Bible study with Walking Through the Word. We'll be back next week with another study in God's Holy Word. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom.